Hi, everyone. I'm Noah Golowicz, and this is joint work with Sharaf Tatatil, Kostis Deskalakis, and Asuos de Glor. In this talk, I'm going to talk about the problem of min-max optimization. In this problem, there's two agents, which we call a min player and a max player, and they choose input vectors, x and y respectively, to some function f. The min player wants to choose x in such a way so as to minimize the value of f, and the max player wants to choose y in such a way so as to maximize the function f. This saddle point problem has many applications in modern machine learning, and I'll mention a few here. One example is Wasserstein GANs. So here the min player chooses the parameters x of some generator network, which we'll denote by gx, and the max player chooses the parameters y of some discriminator network, which we denote by gy. Given a random noise vector, the generator passes this noise vector through its network and outputs a set of fake images. Given this set of fake images and a set of real images, the discriminator network is trained so as to classify an image as real or fake. And so here the function f takes the following form. It's the probability that the discriminator classifies a real image as real, minus the probability that the discriminator classifies a fake image generated by the generator network as real. The discriminator wants to maximize this objective while the generator wants to minimize it. Another example occurs in multi-agent RL where f of x, y is the value of a zero-sum Markov gain, where the uh, policies to the min and the max player are parameterized by their vectors x and y. In this paper, we're going to consider the convex concave saddle point problem, which means that f of x, y is convex in x and concave in y. We also assume that f is L smooth, meaning it is L Lipschitz gradients. Now, even though that Many of the applications of the saddle point problem, such as the ones I mentioned in the previous slide, are not convex concave. Assuming convexity and concavity um, and proving theoretic results assuming this can give us intuitions and algorithms and techniques, which then hopefully will carry over to the non-convex case. One advantage of assuming convexity is that under mild additional assumptions, namely compactness of the domain, it's straightforward to show that there exists a Nash equilibrium, X star, or Y star. This is defined as a point in which each player is best responding given the other player's uh, choice of, of action. In particular, for any alternative x uh, of the min player, the value of f will only increase. And for any alternative y of the max player, the value of f will only decrease. The goal in this talk is to find algorithms which can compute in a Nash equilibrium approximately. And the way we measure how good an approximate Nash equilibrium is is the primal dual gap function. So given a candidate point x hat y hat, the primal dual gap denoted by gap of x hat y hat is defined as follows. It's the difference between the largest the max player can make the function f by choosing some alternative y, and the smallest the min player can make the function f by choosing some alternative x. These alternatives little x and little y have to lie in some compact sets capital X and capital Y. I won't explain here in detail how they're chosen, uh, and you can see our paper uh, for more details about this. Notice that the primal dual gap function at the Nash equilibrium x star y star is equal to zero by definition of a Nash equilibrium. So I'll next describe one simple uh, algorithm which we might try to use to converge to use to converge to to, to a Nash equilibrium. Uh, before describing this algorithm, which is known as GDA, I'll mention that the function f uh, we're going to assume it's going to be defined for all vectors x and y in Euclidean space. This is known as the unconstrained setting. So here's how this algorithm, GDA, or gradient descent ascent, operates. We initialize vectors x0 and y0 in Euclidean space and fix a positive step size eta. At each time step t, we're going to make the following updates. We let xt plus 1 be the result of taking a gradient step in the direction of decreasing the function f from xt. And similarly, to get yt plus one from yt, we take a gradient step in the direction of increasing the function f. So this is really in direct analogy to gradient descent, which converges to global minimizers of convex functions. Unfortunately though, the iterates of GDA actually diverge for very even very simple convex concave functions f. Here's an example where each of x and y is a vector in uh, a single dimension. And as you can see, if the iterates of GDA are initialized near the center, shown in the dark colors. As time progresses, which is shown in lighter colors, 
the inhibits will spiral outwards and eventually diverge to infinity. Fortunately though, there's a simple modification of the GD algorithm for which we actually do get convergence to Nash equilibria in the convex concave case. This is known as the extra gradient algorithm and it was originally introduced by Korpelovich in 1976. Here's how its updates are defined. Given xt and yt at some time step t, before computing xt plus one and yt plus one, we compute intermediate updates, xt plus one half and yt plus one half. And these are simply defined as taking gradient steps from xt and yt in a similar manner to GDA. But then to compute xt plus one and yt plus one, we take another gradient step from xt, yt, but use the gradients computed at the points xt plus one half and yt plus one half. Because we're taking an extra gradient step at each time step, this is known as the extra gradient algorithm. Korpelovich showed that the iterates x t y t of extra gradient converge pointwise to a Nash equilibrium x star y star as t goes to infinity. And indeed here uh, in the same convex concave function as shown in the previous slide, you can see that as time increases in lighter colors, the iterates spiral inwards to the center of the plot, which is where the Nash equilibrium is. Now, the main question that we address in this paper is what are the rates of convergence of the extra gradient algorithm? In particular, how fast does the primal dual gap at xt, yt converge to zero? So there's been some prior work which has uh, addressed this question. Nemirovsky in 2004 showed an explicit rate for the on average convergence of the extra gradient algorithm. In particular, if we let xt bar and yt bar denote the averages of the first t iterates of the extra gradient algorithm, then Nemirovsky showed that the primal dual gap at xt bar and yt bar is bounded above by something on the order of one over t. It's also known that we have best iterate convergence for extra gradient, which means that the smallest primal dual gap up to time t is bounded above by something on the order of one over root t. But neither of these explicit convergence rates address the question of how large the primal dual gap for the iterates xt, yt is. And this is the question we address in this talk. It's actually a more a specific instance of a more general question known as proving last iterate convergence. And in general, the goal of last iterate convergence results is to prove an explicit convergence rate for the iterates xt, yt of some algorithm, such as the extra gradient algorithm, which has a constant step size. And I'll mention some motivation for this uh, direction uh, of proving last iterate convergence. First of all, while we can use techniques such as Jensen's inequality in the convex concave case to obtain guarantees on the average iterates of some algorithm, there is no such theoretical guarantees for averaging in general in the non-convex non-concave case. So therefore it's important to develop techniques and algorithms for converging uh, in a last iterate sense, even for the convex case. Uh, additional motivation uh, for uh, last iterate convergence is that in the setting of multi-agent learning, both the average and the best iterates of some algorithm do not necessarily describe the game dynamics, namely the actions that players play over time. In fact, Murta Kapolis et al. noted that there are games in which you have on average convergence, but for which the actual iterates of the game do not converge in a last iterate sense, and in fact exhibit recurrent behavior. Finally, to explain why we require the algorithm to have constant step size, we'll note that as we marked in some previous works, having a step size decay uses new information acquired in the form of new gradients with decreasing weight over time. And this is likely to be implausible in practice. Okay, so now we'll state our main theorem for the convergence of extra gradient. We assume that the convex concave function f uh, has an L Lipschitz gradient, as I said before. And we also assume that it has an L lambda Lipschitz Hessian for some positive lambda. This assumption is made in all second order methods. We're not sure if it's necessary for first order methods such as extra gradient. And we leave that question of removing this assumption uh, to future work. We assume that we initialize extra gradient at some point x dot y naught of distance at most d from the equilibrium. And we assume the step size eta of extra gradient is bounded above by something on the order of one over L or one over lambda d, whichever is smaller. And here's the theorem we show. We show that under these assumptions, the iterates x t y t of extra gradient have primal dual gap bounded above by something on the order of d squared over eta root t. 
if we view d l and lambda all as constants, then this is uh, something on the order of one over root t. And this is interesting because it's slower than the rate that Nemirovsky showed for the average iterative extra gradient. That rate was d squared over eta t. So there's a quadratic gap in the dependence on time between last iterate and average iterate convergence. Moreover, we show in our second main result that this gap is actually necessary. In fact, we show something even stronger. Not only that it's necessary for the extra gradient algorithm, but this gap occurs for any algorithm which satisfies last iterate convergence uh, in a certain family of last iterate algorithms. Now, we have to be a little bit careful about how we phrase this result because we, we need to really focus on the last iterate algorithms and rule out uh, on average convergence in order to prove a lower bound of one over root t. And the way we do this is we focus on the family of degree k one SCLI algorithms which was recently considered uh, in, in uh, other work by Azizian in 2019. I won't formally say what this family of algorithms is, but to give you some intuition as to what types of algorithms uh, uh, these include, I'll mention a subclass of this family of algorithms, which is known as k-step extrapolation methods. These k-step extrapolation methods are similar to extra gradient, but instead of taking a single extra gradient each step, they take k minus one extra gradients at each time step. In particular, it defines k minus one intermediate points, xt plus one over k, xt plus two over k, and so on. And similarly for the max variables, yt plus one over k, um, and so on. And each of these intermediate points is defined as a gradient step starting at xt or yt, but using the gradient defined at the previous intermediate point. Now this is a generalization of extra gradient, which is a two-step extrapolation method. And the main lower bound result in this paper is that for any such degree k1 SCI algorithm, there is some smooth convex concave function f so that the iterates xt, yt of the algorithm applied to f have primal dual gap at time t, at least a constant times one over k root t. So for x gradient where k equals two, we get that the lower bound of one over root t from the upper bound uh, is tight. And moreover, I'll note that the dependence on k here uh, is also tight. In the remainder of this talk, I'll talk about the uh, proof of our uh, upper bound, which shows the primal dual gap of the iterative extra gradient is bounded above by something on the order of one over root t. Uh, to do this, uh, I'll introduce a little bit of notation. So let's define capital G of xy to be the following vector. It's the concatenation of the gradient with respect to x of f of xy and minus the gradient with respect to y of f of xy. Because f is convex concave, it suffices to show uh, that the norm of the operator G at time t is bounded above by one over root t. And moreover, uh, recall from the best iterate convergence results that there is always guaranteed to be some time t star before time t so that the norm of the operator g at time t star is bounded above by one over root t. So the main contribution of this work is to show that best iterate convergence implies last iterate convergence. And to do this, we use the following lemma which states that for all t, the norm of the operator g at time t plus one does not increase much over the norm of the operator g at time t. And once we have this lemma, we simply use an induction starting an induction argument starting at time step t star and applying this lemma a total of t minus t star times to conclude an upper bound in the norm of the operator g at time t. In turn, to prove lemma one, our, our main lemma, uh, we use Taylor's theorem and Lipschitzness of the Hessian of the function f to write the operator g at time t plus one as a matrix times the operator g at time t. This matrix is equal to one i the identity minus a plus a b for some matrices a and b, which are approximately the step size times the Jacobian of the operator g at x t and y t. These matrices a and b also have uh, bounded spectral norm difference. And our second main lemma gives an upper bound on the spectral norm of this matrix shown in red. And this is enough to prove lemma one. Okay, so in this paper, we show that there's a provable quadratic speed up for averaging the iterates of extra gradient in the convex concave saddle point problem. An interesting direction for future work is, is to extend to the non-convex case, where empirical studies have indicated that averaging does help convergence in GANs. And in fact, this even carries over to large scale GANs to save the results. But the big question is why averaging helps in this case, 
And it's hard even to show that averaging doesn't hurt because we can't use Jensen's inequality. So our paper can be found at this link. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>